Now, at this moment, I would like uh, to present Mr. Sean Faircloth, Director of Strategy and Policy with the U.S. Richard Dawkins Foundation. Ms. Mr. Faircloth served 10 years in the Maine legislature and has written a book called Attack of the Field Grants over there. And copies of the book uh, are available uh, in the back for sale. And he, he's going to make a presentation on the Richard Dawkins Foundation. So please give him a warm welcome. I'm Sean Faircloth, and if you believe in the separation of church and state, if you believe in the values of Jefferson and Madison, I've got some people here believe in those things because if you do, you're my boss and I work for you. Because Richard Dawkins asked me to work on your behalf on secular public policy in Washington, D.C., on secular political strategy in every single state of the Union, and with richarddawkins.net, the most visited website in secularism, to bring us all together so we can change the world. That is the mission. That is what we are trying to do. that Dr. Dawkins implies that certain passages in the Bible may not be literally correct. <laughs> but you can just ignore this book because I've been to the Creation Museum in Kentucky. <laughs> Woo! And I know, I know that book's not true because I learned at the Creation Museum how the dinosaurs got on the ark. It was because they were baby dinosaurs. I know this because it says so on a plaque at the Creation Museum. Some of you might be making fun here. And I just want you to know how important the Noah story is to American public policy where I've lobbied in Washington, D.C. Because some of you may not be familiar with Congressman John Shimkus, who's the chair of a committee and one of the 535 people who make decisions for 300 million Americans. And Congressman Shimkus said, in an official hearing of the United States Congress that had to do with concern of the seas rising as a result of global warming, he said, well, you don't need to worry about the seas rising because it says in the Bible, one flood, Noah's flood, God promised, that's it, game over, we don't need to worry about it anymore. We thank you for settling that issue, <laughs> Because Congressman Shimkus is one of what I call the fundamentalist 50 that I write about in my book. 50 of the most extreme theocrats in Congress who consider themselves experts on the Bible and want to impose their expertise on you through American law. Now, I don't actually have much expertise about the Bible. In fact, most of what I learned about the Bible, I learned when I got a children's Bible when I was 12 years old, uh, and on summer vacation, uh, we were going out, you know, one of those road trips in the American West, and I decided I'd read the children's Bible, because it was like Utah someplace, so it could look kind of biblical there, you know. And I was reading the children's Bible, and I got to the part where God instructs Abraham to kill his son, and I learned from the Bible that this is a good thing. That means that he Abraham is God-fearing if he's willing to kill his son. And I'm looking up at my dad in the driver's seat thing, and I'm hoping he's not too God-fearing. This is just what I don't understand this. But it was that first moment for me, and maybe many of you have experienced a similar moment, when I had questions. I had a question in my mind. Would a moral God or anyone else suggest to a parent that they kill their child, even as a test of loyalty? And would a moral parent even consider killing their own child at the behest of a god or anybody else? And then a third question. Are children some form of property, some form of chattel that we used as a pawn in uh, religious rites and ceremonies? 
So that's a legend from many years ago. We all know it. It's part of our culture. I want to tell you a true story from the 21st century in the United States of America. There was a little girl named Amelia White. Now, Amelia was two years old, and like most girls that age in America today, the boys, they uh, sent her to childcare. And unfortunately, at Amelia White's childcare, they lost track of her. And she was left alone in a van in the sun in Alabama in the summertime for two hours. And after two hours, little Amelia White's heart came out, and she died alone in that van. And on the outside of the van were painted the words, Holy Church. And I want you to picture two child cares in Alabama side by side, one secular, one religious. The secular child care has to obey medication segregation regulations. The secular child care has to obey food safety regulations. The secular child care has to have staff training. The secular child care has to have staff child ratios. The secular child care is subject to unannounced state inspections. All the health and safety laws that apply to the secular child care, the religious child care is exempt from those regulations. But you don't need to worry because the head of the Alabama Christian Coalition said, well, the pastors and the congregations, they're our quality control. And to be fair, maybe the death of Amia White was a fluke, <coughs> except there was a boy named Demiron Lindley. He was three years old. He was left alone in a van in the sun at a religious child care in Alabama for 10 hours. And then he died alone in that van. Now, deaths are rare, but much more common are situations of neglect for children. Children left in their own feces for hours. Fly-by-night facilities that suddenly get religion so they don't have to obey the law. That's the situation in the United States of America today. And not just in Alabama, but there are 13 states that have some form of exemptions for religious children <coughs> from their laws. And by the way, it's your tax money at work because the children get the low-income subsidy, federal low-income subsidy, so money from your pocket goes to a religious child care, which in turn doesn't need to obey the laws of its own state. Now I want to tell you another ancient story. This one is true. A story of the Incas. About 500 years ago, pre-Columbian times, they had a ritual. They would take children, they would drug them, and they would bring them up to the mountains, and they would kill them as a sacrifice to their gods. It was part of their religious tradition. But they did drug the children. And they did kill them rather swiftly. I want you to contrast that with a true story from the 21st century in the United States of America. There was a girl in Tennessee named Jessica Crank. And Jessica Crank had a tumor growing on her shoulder. Now, it was a perfectly treatable tumor with modern medical science, but her mother did not believe in modern medical science. And she believed in so-called faith healing. And in Tennessee law, there is a separate and more lenient standard for child neglect, child medical neglect, for so-called faith healing. So as a result, Jessica Crank's tumor grew and grew and grew until it was literally, not figuratively, literally the size of a basketball on this girl's shoulder. She suffered horrible, agonizing, torturous pain, worse than anything that was experienced at Abu Ghraib, and then she died. That happened in the 21st century in the United States of America. You know, the former governor of Alaska, regarding the health care bill, talked about death panels. Well, the situation for that child was a real death panel. One person that decided her terrible torture and then her death. You hear from the right to life groups. Well, where were the right to life groups on this one? Sometimes it seems as if they think life begins at conception and ends at birth. We need to care more about that.